It's not just waiting. <laughs> oh wait. It looks like we are now live. I guess so. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for part two of the artist talk Gaya Wafa at Oil Chinatown on public art and neighborhood recovery. My name is Hoi. I'm the curator at the Chinese Culture Center of San Francisco. We're a 50 plus year old art and culture organization based in Chinatown. Our mission is to elevate underserved communities and give voice to equality through contemporary art and education. Through our curatorial programming, we provide space for artistic experimentation, working within a cultural community and promoting exchange amongst wider audiences. First, I would like to 
create some space for the rage and sadness from this past week to acknowledge another horrible act of police brutality and the shooting of Jacob Blake, along with subsequent hate and violence. I want to reiterate CCC and Chinatown stance in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Chinatown across sectors and the art community will continue to work in a shared vision to counter a narrative of hate and systemic racism. So I hope everyone is practicing self-care. I know the fire in California and the pandemic has been ongoing as well, um, which is why I'm excited to be able to spend the next hour here with the audience and our guests. I hope it will be an energizing way to start weekends with. Um, so last week we had Jeremiah from 100 Days Action, Chelsea Wong and Jennifer Walford. We heard about an overview of the Art for Essential Workers project by 100 Days Action, which prompted a, a series of incredibly hopeful artwork in Chinatown. Jeremiah shared about his curatorial process between placing a range of artworks on storefronts in the Mission and Chinatown. Uh, Chelsea and Jennifer both shared their artistic process, what kind of consideration they had uh, as artists when they work publicly. And of course, a big part of the previous talk was us gushing about how we feel about Chinatown and why it's a special place. Um, and today we will continue to provide this forum to look at artworks and listen to the artists who are able to present their work in Chinatown through the Art for Essential Workers project. Um, this talk especially will get into the juncture between art, advocacy and neighborhood engagement. We're very excited to have our presenter, Jeremiah Barber again uh, with Christine Wong Yap and Jocelyn Tsai. Um, I want to give a special thanks uh, to the support from the Community Challenge Grant, the Andy Warhol Foundation for Visual Arts, San Francisco Foundation, San Francisco Grants for the Art, uh, San and the San Francisco Arts Commission, Flysharker Foundation, our donors, supporters, and CCC contemporaries. And a super quick shout out to our board members, Lauren Wu McLean, Cynthia Thompson, Tatwina Lee, Board Emeritus Irene Yi Riley for being champions and leaders in our communities and for joining us today. Okay, some house rules before we get started. Um, I highly encourage everyone to use the chat function on YouTube. Um, we will be engaging with our audience there and also we will select some questions that will guide the panelists um, during our Q&A. Um, you're uh, highly encouraged to put hearts, smiley faces, at oil, gaiao, you know, um, to show support and kind of virtually clap, right? And then shout out to our comments moderator and CCC team member, YY and Wei Ying, for keeping the chat a safe space. So let's get right into it. Our first presenter is Jeremiah from 100 Days Action. 100 Days Action is a Bay Area artist collective that produces creative resistance projects to build community at the intersection of art, activism, and social engagement formed immediately after the 2016 presidential election in response to Trump's 100-day action plan, a 100-day plan, the collective collaborates with local and national artists on exhibitions, performances, protests, and group actions that stand against bigotry, xenophobia, racism, sexism, and the destruction of the environment. 100 Days Action presents interactive projects, installation events that prompt civic engagement and ask visitors to directly embody and envision the future they want to see. Jeremiah Barber, who's a member of the group, is an artist, educator, and organizer whose work is socially driven and wilderness inclined. He uses performance and sculpture to explore perception and systems of belief. Take it away, Jeremiah. Thank you, Hoi. Um, and uh, thanks to the Chinese Cultural Center for hosting us. Um, I'm really excited to be speaking today with Christine and Jocelyn. Um, and I'm going to get a few images open here. I guess something closed, sorry. Okay. Um, can you see that okay? Okay. Um, so I'm here with 100 Days Action and we are a 10 member collective of artists, curators, designers, educators, um, and um, I, I'm representing 100 Days, uh, but there are many people in our group and uh, several were involved in this project. Uh, we are kind of working on art and civics projects, so I also want to take the moment to encourage everyone to do one action today, which is to fill out your census form. Um, San Francisco is undercounted and uh, it's a process that takes uh, 10 minutes and any uh, resident of California can do it. You can do it online, you can do it by phone, or you can do it in the mail. 
um, and also request your mail-in ballot while you're at it. Um, we started this project at the beginning of the quarantine um, that is called Art for Essential Workers. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the origin of the project and some of our partnerships, and then I'll be passing it over to the artists. So um, we started because uh, Greg Folco is a resident of the mission and a 100 Days fan uh, contacted us and asked us if we wanted to collaborate on putting artwork up on the boarded up storefronts. At the time, it was just a couple of days into the quarantine and um, I hadn't left my house. I had no idea that boards were going up in general. So um, of course we know there's a lot of different artist groups that ended up doing something very similar. Um, so one thing that kind of defines our project is that we, uh, first of all, we didn't know if it was going to be legal to uh, send people out into the street at the time. Um, and so we also wanted to raise funds and support artists. And in order to do that, we decided that we could take a, our own kind of calculated risk by instead of doing a kind of mural project, we could have prints and we could put the prints up in windows and also we could weed paste them, which is a really uh, easy process of a, a paste that you can make at home. Um, and then it would also allow us to work with artists who don't just do a painting process. So um, we reached out to artists that we knew. Uh, we also got, got an early partnership with Facebook who had, uh, had been looking for ways to support their former artists and residents. And so uh, about half of the artists that we worked with are former artists and residents at Facebook. And uh, we worked together to get this group of artists. And usually most of the artists were doing very responsive pieces, um, things that they made um, during the quarantine. And, um, and we asked them to speak directly to essential workers, people that had to be, uh, had to be outside. Um, and so that was kind of the early vision of the project that carried through. Uh, we were working in the mission primarily and also in Chinatown uh, where Facebook connected us to uh, some community organizations. So um, I also wanted to give a little shout out to George and Amanda at the Chinese Newcomer Service Center, um, Ava at the Chinatown Merchants Association and Ben Chan at the Chinatown Visitor Info Center. Um, these folks all did so much to connect us to businesses, uh, many of which were not open and obviously uh, harder to get in touch with. Um, the, the project has shifted over time, it has changed. And, uh, you know, and the way that we set it up for artists to be responsive to what's happening right now, um, also responded to um, the, the moment in which, um, you know, we had collectively watched um, murders and lynchings of, of um, African Americans at the hands of the police. Um, so um, after the Ahmaud Arbery killing Breonna Taylor and George Floyd's death, um, I think there was this moment where people really went out in the street and were putting up these much more urgent messages directly on the bordered up storefronts. And so the artists that we worked with um, were also kind of reflecting that moment. Um, and um, so I, I guess I also just wanna kind of acknowledge these overlapping crises that we're all dealing with. I'm really excited to talk to two artists who've done so much uh, advocacy in their work and who treat their work very fluidly between, um, between something that's aesthetic and something that involves um, making uh, real gestures towards, um, towards um, directing people to action. Um, and uh, I also just wanted to show, since I'm doing the slideshow, I wanted to show very quickly the couple other projects that we had in Chinatown, Chelsea Wong's work um, and Jennifer Wofford's work uh, that we talked about last week. So I believe those videos are still available if you wanted to check those out on YouTube. Um, and last, I'm just gonna do a really quick introduction to the two artists here. Um, Jocelyn, I really love the exuberance and joy of your work. I'm really excited to hear about your process. And um, I guess personally, the thing that I connect to is that despite there being this kind of joy and playfulness, there's also this kind of like squishiness to the characters that you use. Um, and so it feels like a very kind of emotionally complex um, figure that you represent in your pieces. Um, and Christine, um, I'm really excited to hear about the Belonging Project. And um, I'm really especially interested right now in this, um, this thread that I see in your work of kind of speaking with and including the voice of elders 
um, and looking to elders as a source of wisdom. Um, and um, I might be a little too excited to point out that you both have projects called Belonging. So um, I don't know if you noticed that, but um, that's gonna be interesting to also uh, talk about. It. Um, Hoy didn't mention who was going first, I don't think. So I'm just gonna pass it back to Hoy. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Jeremiah. It's it's good to it's good to hear from you how the how the project has evolved to to coexist with a lot of public actions that's happening. You know, it's almost serving us as, as in thinking about who you're sharing the space with, with as you're working publicly and as the nation is going through drastic changes at the same time. So next up, we have Christine Wong Yeah, I'll do a, do a quick bio intro. Christine is a project-based artist who often uses printmaking, drawings, and social practice to explore psychological well-being. She has participated in over a dozen residency and studio programs. A longtime resident of San Francisco Bay Area, she now lives and primarily works in Queens, New York, while returning frequently to the Bay Area for family and art projects. Currently, her artwork, Thanking Essential Workers, appears on billboards in Times Square, on bus shelters and newsstands in New York City, Boston, and Chicago. She's also, the current, she's also currently the lead artist in art, culture, and belonging in San Francisco and Chinatown. So take it away, Christine. All right. Well, thank you so much to CCC and 100 Days Action for making this opportunity possible. And thank you also, Boy and Jeremiah, for reiterating the calls for justice for Black lives. Um, I will start from the beginning if I can share my screen. All right. So as I mentioned, I'm the lead artist in this project. Hoy invited me. I'm sorry. I have to stop. I can't <laughs> the auto thing. Sorry. Here we go. Okay. So Hoy invited me about a year ago to um, be a lead artist in collaboration with CCC, as well as the Chinatown Arts and Culture Coalition, to kind of lay the groundwork and do some community, some more community engagement around how arts and culture impact individual sense of belonging in Chinatown, and that's in the lead up to applying for cultural district designation. Um, so what I did is I developed a, a questionnaire and we invited people to share their stories of belonging. And it could be about a place of belonging or activities where they feel a sense of belonging. Um, sorry about the dogs in the background. It's, uh, it always, that's how it goes. You start a Zoom call and the dogs start barking. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, so we had done this in the spring and the coalition and CCC had done a lot of outreach to the community and we collected a bunch of stories. And it was right then when Jeremiah invited me to contribute to um, messages, um, sorry, to 100 Days Action messages for essential workers, or for essential workers. And luckily the site that they found through the visitor center is um, Dragon Seed, which has a lot of personal resonance for me because I had been there before. I shopped there in advance of my wedding. And it's also right across the street from Portsmouth Square, which is the big park that's like the heart of Chinatown. And one of the questions that I had asked in um, the questionnaire is like, what are your hopes for Chinatown? And um, Art for Essential Workers had asked specifically for um, messages that were optimistic. So these are a great fit. These are just a few of the answers that people contributed. And also this was in March. And I think that's when we were starting to hear about more incidents of anti-Asian violence happening all around the country through the news and just through our friends. And um, when I saw that YY had wrote less discrimination, more understanding, and it was important to include it. And then now also to think about that in the context of confronting anti-Blackness in our communities, as well as homophobia and transphobia. So there were two panels, and then this is the other one. And I do think um, the theme of like intergenerational relationships is one that keeps popping up in the stories. Um, that we've collected. Um, so that's the project for 100 Days Action. And then the rest of the project, I'm interpreting the stories. And um, I've done other projects about belonging in the past as well. And in those, I kind of left longer excerpts in people's own words in books. 
And then this time, knowing that um, in Chinatown, that the, the residents are oftentimes seniors or kids, I thought um, a nice way to um, present the stories is as comics. So um, here's an example. Um, it's from Caroline Cavading. And you can see here again, this idea of intergeneration, um, intergenerational relationships. And um, it was really interesting for me because, you know, as a, a community-based artist, I really welcome and appreciate when I learn things. And I had framed the project to be about Chinatown. And I, I realized I need to expand it to mention and specify and say the name of Manila Town. So this is another um, page in Caroline's story. And some of the um, comics that I'm drawing for the comic book will be personal narratives like this. This is also from Caroline's story. And then some of them will be street scenes like this. So this is about a favorite activity, which is shopping on Stockton Street for groceries and produce. Um, another favorite activity is going to the Lunar New Year Festival. So these are kind of like multi-vocal um, mashups of different people's voices in the same page. And I, I just this morning was remembering how I'm a big fan of um, Lucy Lepard's book, The Lure of the Local. And that was one of the first books I read when I started to think about belonging and places of belonging. And she talked about like multi-centeredness that you can have one place of belonging or you can have multiple places of belonging. So these are just two kind of previews of the comics I'm working on. There's gonna be over 40 pages total. We are making it bilingual. I'm very excited to be partnering with CCC because they're the ones who make the bilingualness happen. <laughs> I can't do that myself. And so a special shout out to YY and Wei Ying for their help with that. There's gonna be three illustrated maps of places of belonging, 12 personal histories or street scenes. And we are hoping to launch it in October at 41 Ross in Ross Alley. All right, that's it for me. Thank you, Christine. I think that the project has been so, so revealing and so heartwarming at the same time. And I think the the launch with, you know, with it being inclusive of Chinatown and Manila Town is going to be so, uh, it's going to be so special. And let's see, next up we have Jocelyn Tsai. Um, Jocelyn is Taiwan born, Shanghai raised artist, recently, uh, currently based in Oakland, California. Her work is the reflection of identity, human nature, and the intangible aspects of life. The recurring theme throughout her work involves an amorphous figure that is meant to embody the spirits of beings as a whole. Faceless and ambiguous, the figure she illustrates acknowledge the universal thoughts, feelings, and emotions that are shared by us all. Zai was recently featured on Hyperbeast Pen and Paper, April edition, in which she shared her creative journey and her project Save Our China Chinatowns, a campaign to raise support for merchants, seniors, and residents of San Francisco and Oakland Chinatowns amid the COVID-19 crisis. So we have Jocelyn coming up. Thank you, Hoi and CCC for having me. Um, and thank you for the intro. My voice is a little bit raspy right now. I have a feeling it's from the air quality, which is actually pretty crazy. But let me share my screen and I'll talk through a bit about my work. Can everyone see this? Okay. So this is just a page to kind of give a give an overview of my work as a whole. I do a lot of murals. Well, pre-COVID, I did a bunch of murals. Um, I've only done a handful of public facing murals, but I often do interior murals for um, workspaces. I also have my own painting practice that I'm trying to grow and evolve. And I do a lot of editorial illustration um, for publications. 
So this is the piece that I got to do for Jeremiah's project, um, Art for Essential Workers, as part of 100 Days Action. And when Jeremiah approached me to create something for um, one of the Chinatown storefronts, I, I think that was kind of like a challenge for me, even though I had done a mural before in Chinatown, but in New York, which was also a separate challenge, just because my work does tend to lean towards the abstract I wanted the work for Chinatown to be something that Chinatown residents could relate to or have like some immediate connection to. But I know even though my work is meant to be inclusive, it can sometimes feel a bit hard to understand, especially for like older immigrant um, residents of neighborhoods like Chinatown. So I think having that phrase, Jiayou, and we got this was how I wanted to connect to the people that would walk by and see this as something that would be uplifting for this current time. And definitely wanted to make it more vibrant and joyous. So the colors are all very bright and bold. Um, and it was really awesome to see the photos of the install because I didn't get to see it in person and I actually got some messages from people who live in the area saying that they saw this work being put up or they saw it after it was put up and that it did bring some sort of positivity to their day. And that was really nice to hear because I think with public facing work, that's what I try to bring to the neighborhood. And especially for essential workers, I wanted to create something that was, that would be a bit more uplifting that they could see throughout the day. So also in response to kind of the anti-Asian um, anti racism that was happening throughout the country while COVID was starting to spread, I wanted to create a fundraiser called Save Our Chinatowns that would raise funds for the Bay Area Chinatowns in San Francisco and Oakland specifically. And this was kind of like, a quick response project, just seeing how all the Chinatowns were struggling and wanting to really create something that would be positive and helpful for the local businesses. So I had thought about this project and I had reached out to a friend that was doing something similar in New York and they did something called Dumplings Against Hate. And with their help and kind of seeing what they were doing and how they were helping New York Chinatown businesses. I launched Save Our Chinatowns and partnered with Chinatown CDC in San Francisco and Good Good Eats in Oakland Chinatown. So this is kind of like the website that I created. It started off really simply just like, okay, I'm gonna start a website. It's gonna have all the information outlining like why we need to um, help Chinatown and the ways we can help, which for my project specifically, I had a GoFundMe and it's actually still going on because I feel like Chinatowns need, you know, long-term funds. Um, and I got the help of some illustrator friends who made some of the graphics for the website and for the Instagram. And even though this was my first time doing something like this, um, it was really helpful since everyone was digital remote to like have this space online and have people share it and like send it along to their networks. And it really did take off. And it was really awesome to see how people were so willing to help Chinatowns. Recently, I've always also been trying to um, think of more ways that art can be utilized to help with this initiative. So since I am an artist, it is a lot easier for me to, you know, extend the conversation to my artist networks and kind of see if there are new ways that we can help the Chinatown communities. And Good Good Eats, the Oakland Chinatown nonprofit that I work with through Save Our Chinatowns actually came to me with this idea where they wanted to have like a call for submissions for anyone to submit 
their fondest memory of Chinatown. And it can be any Chinatown in the world. And you can be any age, you can be young, you can be old and just share a memory of Chinatown with us. And I curated a group of five Asian American artists um, based in the US and each one picked their favorite memory and illustrated it into a print that can now be purchased. Um, the link is up here. <laughs> um, and it can be purchased with all the funds going towards, well, originally all the funds were gonna be going towards Good Good Eats to support their um, projects and helping feed Oakland Chinatown as well as um, helping the local businesses stay afloat. But they have decided to redirect all the funds to um, farm workers that have been affected by the wildfires in California. So um, it's been really amazing to work through this whole process just from, you know, ideating to like speaking to the artist uh, and also having and seeing like what they come up with and seeing the community engagement, how people have been loving to share their uh, stories and also seeing their stories kind of come to life in an image and art form. So this is what I'm hoping to continue with for Save Our Chinatowns is just seeing how artists like myself or my networks can become more involved in these types of community projects and what else we can do to continue helping Chinatowns. Thank you, Jocelyn. I, I love hearing really your, your journey of advocacy. I think in just these few few short months, maybe it felt like a long time, but you really you really build a community and a network of folks and kind of new allies to, to begin to think about and to care for Chinatown um, and to have really um, substantive way of supporting it and the artists at the same time. So it's and, and you're able to kind of use your use your um, kind of intuition in your spaces to really um, outreach to the audience that you're facing um, to make this work very effective. So thank you for sharing this this journey um, with the audience today. So now now let's get into maybe unpacking some of the things that that that's we've been thinking about. So actually, I have a, so the first question is for for artists uh, Christine and Jocelyn to start with. I feel like I've been, you know, working in Chinatown for maybe three, four years, and and I think about this place a lot. <laughs> and then, so anytime I, I kind of get into conversation about people who also think about what what makes Chinatown special, I uh, it's often very um, a very uh, interesting and revealing moments. I think um, so. So since you've both been kind of doing longer term creative projects in Chinatown and have connections to Chinatown, both San Francisco, Oakland, and New York. Um, maybe if you can share a little bit about your personal feelings, uh, maybe an emotion, you know, word or phrase or something that you're grappling with as you're working um, and thinking about this neighborhood. Uh, maybe I'll toss it to Christine to start and then Jocelyn. Yeah, um, so I've been just making these comics and thinking a lot about what, what they mean and um, finding the themes in them. And the huge theme is like, um, memory, and I think it's really interesting that Jocelyn's project is also asking people to, to kind of like conjure their memories. Um, for so many of the stories, like I mentioned, it's about fond memories of grandparents, and there's two actually personal narratives that are um, kind of honoring grandparents who have passed on by just sharing remembrances of them. Or sometimes it's people who are sharing, sharing memories of like childhood trips to Chinatown and how the reason it was uh, important for their family is because their dad grew up there. So maybe they didn't grow up there, but it's there's like a legacy of memory or something like that. Um, and I, I was thinking also a lot about um, how, um, how a lot of people talked about place and um, how Chinatown is a place that can bring a distant place near. Like it reminds you of, if you're from China, of China and your hometown and it makes you feel at home because it reminds you of this other place. Or it can also like, because you taste a certain food and it reminds you of your mom's cooking and it can make you feel closer to her. Um, so it's this kind of idea of like, um, kind of like magical, like 
transportation of the mind through like all these senses and cultural things. And um, I was also thinking a lot about memory palaces and how this is kind of like the opposite. Like Chinatown is a memory palace of the city of like walking through alleys and hearing certain sounds or something like that. So that's all. Yeah, that's really awesome because um, what you just said is kind of exactly how I feel like the, um, how it's able to bring a place closer. Um, since I grew up in Shanghai um, and spent a lot of time in Shanghai and Taiwan, um, Chinatown kind of acts as like a piece of home for me. And yeah, even though each Chinatown is different, when I go to a new city, I always like try to visit the Chinatown. And even though I had never been to that Chinatown, it has a way of like, bring me back home and that sense of comfort is like really magical and I think really hard to find elsewhere. So that's why I love Chinatown and um, that's why I really value um, the Chinatown community and want to give back to these communities. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, th I think the yeah, I think for me, like, I mean, just like a really quick ex example is looking at Portsmouth Square and how it has such a, a history since the, the quote unquote founding and the colonization of San Francisco and how it presents itself as a cross section to the different um, major historical moments that has happened for this neighborhood. Um, and that that and that's a space and that's a place that's still still here. And so how that how that is almost like, um, I think maybe Christine has mentioned this to me before, like the like a time machine or something like a portal to to something else. And and I think that's really some 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 feelings that there that definitely percolates when artists work uh, with us and, and think about the space and its impact. And I know the actually all three of you work in um, work in the intersection of art engagement and advocacy. Um, and it re really, you know, it really involves the aspects of time. And so the next question I want to ask you guys if you have any, any thoughts about um, our first essential worker being a, like an urgent response type of artwork and something that's more, uh, more, um, that takes more time to build up to engage uh, and how my um, collaborators support um, or more urgent type uh, projects that we're seeing coming out as well and hello cats again <laughs> we have so many animal friends visiting us in this talk today um yeah maybe i'll start with um jeremiah and then i'll toss it to jocelyn and then christine yeah i think that's a really great question i i feel like um something that i see in in um in christine and jocelyn's work and then in some of our own experiences as 100 days is uh, the significance of spending time um, developing um, partnerships and um, and in speaking with people that are outside of the arts community um, and people that have already developed um, networks of of, um, of of community support and engagement. Um, and then I, I feel like there's that, which is the kind of the longer, slower work. And then there's these moments, uh, which are for essential workers definitely felt like one of those moments where there are very fast opportunities that, um, that you are suddenly working very quickly and very responsibly. Um, and I, I just think that's, that's an interesting relationship where you really have to do the longer, slower work in order to be able to do the faster, more urgent work. Um, and uh, Christine especially is someone who uh, has been, uh, for me personally, I think for 100 days also, um, someone that we've, uh, we've really learned a lot from um, because of her way of kind of, um, of uh, going into that level of depth of the longer work within the, within the shorter projects. Um, so I just wanted to, to, to mention that, like if you look at the, the, the work that you did around this project, um, there's, you know, there's a contextualized framing of it that, um, that you can really, re like, really go into that process um, through your website and the way that you post about it. And so, um, so that's, that's, I think, something that we're always learning. 
I definitely think that since I'm new to this type of work, I have a lot to learn. So <laughs> definitely be looking to you, Christine. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think when I started Save Our Chinatowns, it definitely felt very urgent. It was something that I knew was like happening right then. And I needed to create something quickly to get people's engagement and for people to become aware of the issues surrounding um, anti-Asian racism and how Chinatowns were losing business because of that. Um, and what I think is really interesting is that I started this kind of work during the pandemic. So there were so many limitations, usually with public engagement work, it's, I feel like you can like be on the ground or like be having real time conversations with people in the community or in the neighborhoods. But I was pretty much just like alone in my apartment with a computer. <laughs> so I think, yeah, it's really interesting to think about how these types of mutual aid projects or public engagement projects have had to shift or adapt to the COVID limitations of being everyone being remote and doing things digitally. So something that I've learned to be helpful is reaching out to folks that may be strangers um, like CCC or, you know, um, like and other people who are doing similar things to like kind of ask them what their experiences are, especially because I haven't had personal experience doing this. It was really helpful to gain some different perspectives on how other people were um, doing this kind of work and just being able to connect with people and feel like that it was getting somewhere and that it wasn't all like in my own head and, <laughs> because this kind of work involves so many people and it's to help a community, I think can't just like come from one lens or one perspective that's my own and having other people around whether, I mean, although it was digitally or like across the country was very, very helpful in that sense. Oh, I really resonate with, um, thank you, Jeremiah, for your nice words, but I, I really do think like, um, yeah, this whole project and my, my involvement in this project has been so much facilitated and made possible by this partnership with CCC. And then also really like 100 Days Action did all the work. Like I just sent a file and I, I'm so grateful <laughs> that you guys were able to be on the ground and carry the ladder and clean out the bucket of all the wheat paste and all this stuff. And I, I didn't have to do it, which, um, you know, it just, that is one of the things that made this project go smoothly. It's just like, you guys had like a system in place and took care of it. Um, I think there is something interesting here about this partnership and how quickly it developed. And I was thinking about how, um, like, you know, sometimes grant makers will like say, okay, we have an idea for four years down the road and then we're gonna implement this long-term plan and then we're gonna involve these community neighborhoods and then they're gonna hire artists and then there's gonna be this whole thing. And I was like, why isn't there a more like middle ground kind of like this project where an artist can go or an art collective like 100 Days Action can go to Chinese Culture Center and say, hey, we wanna do this project can you help us because you have the relationships in the community to the business owners, to the publics. And um, yeah, I was thinking about in a way like as a neighborhood based art center, CCC is, could have a role as like a service bureau for artists of like connection and connectivity or something like that. And that's a different way of like, I think how artists usually relate to institutions because if you said to an artist, like, oh, how do you get your foot in the door in the place? And it's like, oh, you gotta go to the openings. And then 10 years later, the curator remembers your name and then blah, 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 you know? Like they would never think to just cold call an email or cold email a curator, you know? Um, and I think this, there's a different, um, there's like a different like uh, relationship that could be developed um, in an interstitial way to help artists partner with community and facilitate things that the community needs, such as translation. Yeah, I often time thinks of CCC as like almost a steward to, 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 for these relationship and projects. And, and it's, it, you know, I say this all the time, it takes, it takes a village to do 
community engagement are. It really does, right? And then, and how to make it as like, you know, as easy for everyone, you know, it's difficult work, but it's only effective when it feels easy. Um, and I also love this, um, uh, this distinction between kind of how like, um, the, you know, the artists come and go, projects come and go, but uh, maybe partners and organizations stay. So in a way that, you know, 100 Day Action would have partnerships and CCC would have partnership that would make like a long project feel shorter because of the work that's been built in. And then also studying and learning how um, Jocelyn is tackling it from a very urgent sense, but then it's building out to a much longer relationship. So it really, it really goes, it really goes both ways. Um, and it's really kind of like, it's, it's such intricate work for any, anyone that is in, in community-based practice. And it's, um, it's reading, like meeting people where they're at because everything is moving and there's no, you know, there's no way without, there's no way to do it without, you know, thinking of the now-ness of it all. Um, so thank you for, for everyone sharing your thoughts and your, you know, in, in some way your expertise in the area. And I, I think that, you know, this, these kind of conversations are pretty rare in, in a way. So, um, it's hard for artists to like, oh, I want to do community based work. So how do you go about it? And again, there's not a bureau that would that would teach you how to do it. You just kind of have to uh, find your find your network and find a safe space to to not only exper like experiments within your own practice, but um, but it's also a supportive and generative network that can actually produce um, substantial work um, in a com community setting as well. Uh, and then, yeah, and just to let you guys know, I know you guys are not looking at the chat so much, but a lot of hearts and claps and, and guyals for, for everyone across the board. Um, so right now I'd like to bring in an audience question. Uh, so, so this person asked, um, do you see these works and conversations moving to other neighborhoods that have become almost like smaller Chinatowns? Um, I think in San Francisco, like maybe Sunset or Richmond, like Irving Streets and Clement Streets. Um, do folks have thoughts around that? Uh, I see twitching eyebrows from Christine, so I'm going to call on you first. <laughs> yeah. I actually, I think that's a great idea. I, I actually, my eyebrows were actually like, I think that's a question for 100 Days Action. <laughs> okay, then Jeremiah, you're up. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I so we are we have one more work that we're installing uh, coming up this week at Artist Television Access. Um, if that question is coming from an artist, I want to encourage them to definitely carry this project um, or your work into into other spaces. Um, we you know we we wanted to create something of a, I guess like an outdoor gallery um, after when when quarantine kind of had loosened and people were outside, we wanted to kind of um, have the works close enough by that you could uh, start to recognize some threads between the pieces by walking around and seeing them together. Um, but of course, there are these boarded up spaces all over the place. And it's going to be quite some time before, um, before we see a, a change in that. And also a lot of the places that we put up work um, those works are, you know, they're down or other street art has gone up on top of them. So the street art is a kind of a continuous conversation that's happening. And I think that um, that the really interesting thing is how it has evolved over the last couple of months and how artists who, you know, have lost exhibition opportunities and uh, museums and galleries are, you know, are still largely closed. So um, I, I think that that space is still very vibrant and, and, uh, and open space. And there's a mix of, you know, you can do this um, guerrilla style, you can do it through a partnership, which is what we did. We were really in conversation with the business owners to make sure that they were seeing artwork that they were happy with, um, or that kind of was spreading a message that they wanted to spread. Um, that was part of our project. But um, but, you know, we've seen an explosion of street art that is, um, that is also just um, people um, going out and doing it on their own, so. Great. Uh, do you have anything to add, Jocelyn, on this note? I know you don't live in, in San Francisco, but. No, um, don't really have anything else to add, but I think, yeah, it is a really, it would be a really awesome idea to bring these types of initiatives to a bunch of different neighborhoods. And that kind of ties in with what Christine was saying as to how like 
um, organizations like CCC are so helpful in facilitating and also 100 Days Action, um, facilitating that conversation between like artists and businesses or people who are willing to have art up like on their storefronts or just like in a public space because it is really hard I think for artists to get involved with this kind of work. Um, it's almost like a mystery like you some one day you like walk out and see oh wow like this artist did this thing here but like how do they make that happen? It's just like so mysterious and not as transparent as I feel like it could be um, because I know there's so many artists out there who would like love that opportunity to be, be more engaged with their community. Um, so yeah, it would be really awesome to see it in smaller communities and neighborhoods like that too. Yeah, and oh, Christine, do you have something to add? No. Oh, oh so you're my god. Yeah, and I, I'm actually reminded of the like the mo the multi centeredness that that came up in Christine's discussion about. Um, because these, you know, um, I think Chinatowns has this aura of being sort of the epicenter of Asian American identity, and there are other neighborhoods in the city that that do uphold these identities, but not necessarily feel in relation to Chinatown. Um, and perhaps artwork can be a really good way of making those cultural linkage amongst, uh, even within the uh, predominant Asian neighborhoods. Um, in San Francisco. So thank you so much for this question. I think it, it brought a lot of good good thoughts in, in our future planning and projects. Um, great. And then the next, um, yeah, then the next question I, I want to bring up to the group is, you know, when we curate and we think about public art, we always preface it with accessibility and the way that it's open to a more diverse audience. Um, so I definitely want to flip this question on its side and ask, you know, what might be some barriers to experiencing uh, public art in what, you know, and just to open open this conversation up for, for a second here. Uh, let's start with uh, Christine and then Jocelyn and Jeremiah. Yeah, I mean, I, I always like would like my work to be to espouse the values of diversity, equity, inclusion and justice and like the first thing is accessibility and, um, you know, it's really hard. It takes a lot of resources to make things accessible to people. And I've been so grateful to be working with CCC to make um, the content of the comics uh, bilingual. Um, and it's also like um, accessibility across like abilities are a tough one, especially as we're here on a Zoom call and it's probably not translated or interpreted and closed caption and all the different ways that different kinds of audiences need, you know. Um, so it's just, um, you know, and CCC does so much. <laughs> so I'm not saying that, you know, but you know, there's this room for improvement and growth along those lines, but it's a time of flux. And, you know, I don't think anybody knew that we would be doing this online six months ago. So, uh, you know, we're all adapting and learning, I think, too. Um. I think from my point of view, I've only done like a few projects that are public facing like I previously mentioned, but I think when I do approach these types of projects, I try to consider the surrounding area or the people who would walk by in that area as much as possible, especially like with my work leaning towards the abstract, I feel like sometimes instead of feeling inclusive, it can kind of exclude the viewer. And what I want is for my art to be something that can start conversations and something that people are proud to see in their neighborhood um, instead of something that they feel like they can't relate to or understand. And I feel like when it comes to artwork in communities like Chinatown, if it has like no context, it can easily make the residents feel like there's a barrier between them and the artwork and it's not speaking to them. So they don't really understand like why it's there or maybe it doesn't add anything for them to the neighborhood, um, which I think would be like a shame because if there's such a great opportunity for artwork to be somewhere in a neighborhood like Chinatown, we would love for it to speak to 
the people in the community and, you know, have some sort of meaning. And I think this is something that I definitely am still like working through because my work might not necessarily speak to some communities um, like Chinatown, but I think speaking on like the mural that I did in New York Chinatown specifically, I became more literal in that image making process. And I had um, food <laughs> within the mural and like food is such a connecting factor in Chinatown that I, I knew that putting literal images or illustrations of food in there would be something that people can see and, and say, oh, okay, that's a dumpling or that's a moon cake instead of why are there like amorphous figures <laughs> jumping around? Um, so something that's just more relatable and immediately recognizable, similar to how like in the 100 Days Action Art for Essential Workers mural, I had um, the Chinese phrase along with the English phrase just to add to the image. Yeah, I think this is a really good question, a really good challenge for organizers. Um, I, I feel like um, our, uh, our blind spots are sometimes unfortunately discovered through, um, through our mishaps. And then also, um, you know, um, there's also the, that chance that we have to, um, to enact a kind of an, an exclusive project and not learn who we've excluded through that. So I really appreciate um, some of the responses uh, that we have already on this. But um, one thing that I think is really interesting about this moment is the, that combination of real life experience and web-based communities um, that, um, that I think many of us were not really connected by before. And so I, I think there is a real opportunity right now to, uh, to learn a lot more about um, you know, how people are responding to things um, through seeing this public artwork, um, either in person or, um, you know, through a YouTube live stream, I guess. Um, I don't have any, uh, any major, uh, mishaps to report in the installation of Jocelyn and Christine's work while we were out there putting up your work. We just had people walking by that loved what we were doing and, uh, were really, uh, super positive, especially, uh, um, in the color in your work, Jocelyn, I don't know if you notice this from wider photos of the street, but the colors that you used are like perfect mirrors of that particular spot on the block, which was amazing. Um, and Christine, there were uh, storefront owners that were uh, walking by as we were installing that just kept, they, they interacted with me every single time that they came by. They were like super engaged with seeing every new text, every new text panel that went up. So um, so we had a very, a really positive response in the, the times that we were out there. Thank you for sharing that. And, uh, and yeah, one of the magical thing about the public art process is that once you're out there, it, it has started, you know, it's not like when the work is up and you unveil it and people come and you're engaged with it. But like, you know, the second you, you even like just hold, like hold a paintbrush next to, next to some boards, it's like, oh shoot, I, I now need to engage and have an audience here. So, um, so this is something that we notice as well. And then something is particularly hard for, I think, organizers and ourselves to, to really is the measure of measure some of uh, and evaluate some of the visitorship of uh, public art and also the depth of engagement that happens. Um, I think it's it's good when you like talk to people, but sometimes it's some of the those data is still still lacking as we're um, just thoughtfully thinking about each of the projects that that we do, um, whether you know short term or or long term projects. Um, and then, um, so we're actually nearing the, the time of our talk. I think the hour went extremely fast. Um, and I, I, when I would love to cap out the, the discussion with you know, a more hopeful question, which I did ask last week, was how do you describe Chinatown's future in three words? Um, and while the artists prepared their answer, I would like to say the words that came out last week, which is inclusive, intergenerational, creative, resilient, stronger, tasty, civility, fluidity, color, and adventure. So <laughs> what would your three hopeful words for Chinatown be? Let's start with Christine and Joseph. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I tried it in last week, intergenerational, and I still pick it this week. <laughs> and then my other two words were beloved and um, a sense of placefulness. Oh, those are so nice. <laughs> um, my three words are re-energized, awareness, and growth. That's so beautiful. And if the audience member have their three words to Chinatown, mm -hmm. please put it in the chat as well. And so thank you, everyone. This is, yeah, this is the end of our program. <laughs> oh, uh, Kristen. Jeremiah's three words. Oh, you said it last week, but. Oh, yeah. I said color and fluidity last week, but okay. yeah. I don't know if I have, I, I'm really intrigued by, by place this week a lot of the things that you all said about about forming memories through place so thank you yeah and yeah again thank you so much for being here and and it's been you know a great start to to my saturday at least um huge thanks to the ccc team for keeping this um happening and hopefully we can do more talks about the different artworks um that or different art happenings that happen to be in public in Chinatown uh, and continue these discussions. Um, there are many ways to support Chinatown at the moment. Uh, YY is gonna drop the link into the chat pretty soon about the different COVID-19 resources. Um, you can shop, you can eat, you can purchase um, um, your lunch online and then you can uh, volunteer and donate as well. And then also every weekend until September 20th, there's the Chinatown Walkway Sundays where they block out the streets for, for folks to, uh, for folks to have lunch out, outside. And then also to, um, I think they're doing a really awesome raffles um, these weekends as well if you fill out surveys. So <laughs> that's an extra incentive. Um, and then if you like this talk and would want to get more involved, please visit cccsf.us or shoot us an email at info at cccsf.us. Uh, we are looking for volunteers to support the works of our team. Uh, so thank you so much for, for tuning in. Take care and bye. Oh, can I mention one thing real quick? Jocelyn has an opening today in Oakland. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and Christine, how are we gonna find out about your project in October? Where should we look? Well, just follow CCC. <laughs> yes, look for look for it in October. <laughs> Good luck with the opening, Jocelyn. Thank you. Thanks for the shout out. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. This was so Thank great. You. I really I know. Thank you.